subscribe to this podcast to get exclusive access to the after show shooting the breeze so today we have sarah snyder on and she is going to be uh discussing a little bit of her her experience with cults and uh it's very very important information for all of us to have i think and uh very good insight i think into into a world that many of us are not very familiar with so why don't you start out by just telling us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about what you do. Okay, awesome. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, I am, uh, I guess by trade, I'm a publicist. So I work with people to get them uh, media interviews like this, uh, whether it's podcasts or CNN or uh, things like that. And then uh, I have a background actually as a therapist. So uh, I was a therapist for many, many years, worked with children who had experienced trauma, adult survivors of trauma. Um, and did that about 15 years, uh, which I very much enjoyed, but politics, insurance, that kind of stuff here in the U.S. got me, and so about six, five, six years ago, I switched over to PR, which I also love. It allows me to be creative and strategic, and I enjoy that in my clients, so. Yeah, I love doing interviews like this, too, so I mean, it's just, it's just a lot of fun, Uh, so your testimony, I think, is, is kind of a powerful one here, so why don't you tell us what that testimony is and then what God is currently doing in, in your life? Okay. Um, feel free to stop me anytime you have questions. Uh, but I was raised in what many people would consider a cult. Um, I uh, was born into it. Um, there are There's a broad group of about 50,000 members, but then there's a bunch of subsects of this particular cult. Um, and the one I was raised in, there's about 350 people, maybe 400, um, most of whom are biologically related to me uh, (laughs) or through marriage are related to me. Um, And so people will sometimes ask, well, were you on a compound? Uh, No, I was not raised on a compound. Uh, I did actually go to public school, Um, but it was very uh, indoctrinated. You had to do things a certain way. You had to be a certain way. It was very legalistic. Um, There are things uh, like they do not believe in the Trinity. They do not believe you go to heaven when you die. They don't believe that you go, they believe hell is the grave. So they don't believe in like an everlasting hell uh, when you die. Um, They believe that you very much have to do X, Y, and Z things uh, in order for Christ to uh, even have a chance of salvation uh, with through Christ. And even if you do X, Y, and Z things perfectly, it's still not guaranteed. Um, And so it's very, um, very strict and controlling in the thought processes and how you are to be. Um, And it's very scary. And so a lot of the Bible was used to control and manipulate me as a kid. Um, And so coming through that process of learning that God's actually like a loving, kind, Mm -hmm. uh, caring God, right. And that uh, it's interesting now to be where I am. And so to open the Bible, one of the things I learned um, in the last year (laughs) was that I could, I can open the Bible and read it uh, for myself. uh, And that I don't need someone else to explain the Bible to me. Right. Like, I mean, the translations are great, obviously. Right. But the two, the two men who founded the cult that I was raised in, um, everyone in that cult believes that you have to interpret the Bible through the works of those two men. Uh, and there is, that is quote unquote, the truth. There is nothing outside of that, that, to, that explains the Bible. It sounds um, like, what and so, like medieval kings used to do and how they <laughs> control yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so uh, I, when I, when I became a Christian, I had some wonderful Christian friends and one of them, I guess you guys call it discipling. Uh, she's kind of discipling me. And finally she said, Sarah, you ask wonderful questions about the Bible. Like, I'm so glad, like blah, blah, blah. And she signs it, but she says, you know, you can open it and like read it and ask God to help you understand mm-hmm. it. And, and just like learn that way. And I was like, no, no, I did not know that. Right. Like I thought I had to go through C.S. Lewis or you or yeah. like, you know, yeah. Francis Chan. And so she's like, that's not how this works. Um, so anyway, so that was, that's kind of my upbringing uh, within that uh, all, can I add a little trigger warning for people just to, just a note, it, you know, if, if whatever, what I'm about to say can be sensitive, if they're sensitive ears, kids, whatever around. Um, but during my childhood, there was also quite a bit of sexual abuse. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of spiritual abuse and then a lot of sexual abuse. Um, and so uh, there were pieces of that too, that I've had to obviously work through and kind of come through. Do you have questions before I continue? <laughs> yeah, that, that is, I just want to say that is something very common among 
among cults is is the yeah. sexual abuse, um, and that, that's all part of the the control that that they use to to keep people under their under their thumb, and yeah. uh, and with women especially having you have now have a child with me, so you're stuck here because otherwise you've got to try and raise this child on your own, and you can't do that. Is what they tell them, even though yeah. women have proven time and time again they can be a single mother it's harder but they can be a single mother so yeah i definitely <laughs> d- yep. definitely definitely hear you and, and and just wanted to say it's not uncommon that's that's yeah, very common that's cult. True. Yeah. so i actually left so what happened uh with me was i um i went away to college um and when i left for college uh i i ended up um, funny enough, going to a Christian college and I got there and everybody at the college was, which raised a lot of, I guess, red flags in, in the cult or the religion I was raised and they weren't very happy about it, but I did it anyway. And I went and I got there and, uh, it was funny because the people there uh, were kind of like, Sarah, you kind of believe some weird stuff, right? (laughs) And they were like, you're, this is a little strange. Uh, but people were, you know, kind and, and, you know, loving, uh, but it was, uh, it was a, a little bit of a culture shock for me. Um, and I still held on to the fact that I had the truth and they didn't. Um, and it, they, you know, had no idea what they were talking about. And I actually thought they were trying to manipulate me, a lot of them. Uh, and I, so I made friends, but I was very cautious about a lot of that. Um, but then, uh, at some point, you know, I started working, made other friends. Um, and at some point in my my mid early mid twenties, I started to click that I had friends who were Christians. I had friends who were Jewish. I had friends who were atheists. I had friends who had a wide variety of agnostic, a wide variety of beliefs. But the one thing they all agreed on is that what I believed was weird. <laughs> and all of a sudden they started to click. I'm like, Oh, like all, I have all these different friends now and all these different denominations but they think what I think is weird, right? They don't agree on anything else but that, uh, you know. And so um, I had also um, started learning more about the world and learning some that what I had been taught about the world wasn't wasn't right, like it wasn't true. Um, and so in my early to mid 20s, I'm 40 now. In my early to mid 20s, uh, I started, uh, I I. I was still in the cult, but I didn't like God. And so I actually started praying to quote unquote, like the universe, whatever it was that uh, it would harden my heart so that I could leave because um, I knew I had to get away, but I didn't know how to get away because it's all my relatives. It's all my family. It's all these people that I've known. And thankfully my friends at the time, they were like, Sarah, we'll be your family. Like, it's okay. Like (laughs) we got you. Like you're okay. Uh, and so, and I was in therapy at the time too, uh, which was helpful to work through some of the stuff, some of the trauma I had been through. Um, and so I did end up leaving uh, and I had to write a letter and uh, I wrote a letter and send it to the, they call them ecclesias, to send it to the ecclesia that I was local to. Um, and I had to wait for them to officially reject me because I can't leave on my own accord. So I had to write this letter and there was all these meetings and all this stuff that happened uh, anyway. And so, I finally was allowed, whatever, to leave. I got, I got kicked out. Um, and so from that point, um, I guess it's been my mid-20s for the last 15, 20 years or so, I have really been on this journey of trying to figure out who God actually is and who Jesus is. And um, I was so angry and I was so mad. Um, about all of the abuse and about the way I was treated and about who I thought God was that I couldn't see him even when he was standing in front of my face, which is funny because now I go for a walk and I see the leaves on the tree or I see the bunnies in the grass or I go, you know, I live in Florida, right? So I go out to the ocean and I swim in the ocean and I'm like, you can see God everywhere. Like you can see him in the sand and you can see him with the stars. (laughs) I I feel like a kid, right? I'm like fascinated because I'm like, you can see him everywhere. Yeah. I was saying Um, somebody else just the other day, um, God is all around us. We just have to listen. And it's just like, like you just, I I go on walks, like prayer walks and uh, it's, just uh, usually I do right for interviews, but of course this morning that did not happen. <laughs> well, backwards, yeah. But uh, 
No, it's just no. It's so great. Like now that the weather's nice. When it's cold, it's really really hard to, to do a yeah. prayer walk. <laughs> Those are inside prayer times when it's cold <laughs> outside. But uh, no, it's nice to be able to go for a walk, and even if it's just raining, just go for a walk and just be like, you know, let's just listen and pray and let God um, speak to me because he is all around us, like you say. And you just have to look at everything that he created. And it's just like, wow, like yeah. what an amazing God, like amazing. So I resonate yeah. greatly with, with, with what you're saying there. <laughs> I have moments sometimes where I like, I mean, it sounds cheesy, but I really do have moments where I start to cry sometimes because I'm like, I can't believe I missed this. I can't believe I couldn't see him. Right. Yeah. But I think this is the piece where like God also has to like open your eyes, right? You have to want it and God has to open your eyes to it. Um, anyway, so, yeah. So uh, I was trying to think of if there's something, what I should talk about next, but. Well, I was just wondering, how have you maybe seen God at work throughout your, throughout your life? Like just the different moments where maybe he was reaching out to you and you were just not hearing it. Do you feel like you had those kind of moments? Yeah. Some of my friends that are Christians, they were like, Sarah, God was like shaking you. <laughs> and, like, you like couldn't. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I did is uh, I was actually in college. Uh, they had a revival on campus at uh, one of the weeks because, you know, it's Christian college. So they had some kind of Bible revival and some people come talk. And I remember uh, it was before I left uh, the cult. And I remember I was sitting there and I don't remember who was speaking, but I remember that someone there was speaking. And I remember thinking, uh, I need to give my heart to Jesus. Like I need to, I need to, to do this. And then I remember thinking, if I do that, I will lose everything. And, and I, that'll be it. Like I'll, right. I'll be Fear. essentially yeah. right. And I remember thinking I have to be more careful uh, about my letting my emotions get to me. And I have to be more careful who I hang out with them, where I go. And I, it just terrified me. And, uh, but I, that to me was a God moment, right. Or God was like, Hey, <laughs> like I'm here. Right. Um, and it, there have been other moments where um, like with, the abuse that took place, there are certain moments where I can see where God and his angels must have been protecting me. They, they had to have been there to have protected me. Um, and so, cause I can look back at some of those experiences, like when I, you know, I asked for help and the adults well, wouldn't help me and told me that I had to take care of it and ended on my own. Right. So I went to one of the men who was abusing me and, and essentially was like, Hey, you need to stop. And I was little, I was like 11 or 12, right. When I did that. Mm, and I think about hard. that particular Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think about that particular scenario uh, and he could have killed, he could, he could killed me, he could have right, anything yeah. could have happened. Yeah. And I think about that particular scenario and I think God, God had to have been there. God's angel, right? he had to have been there, which is a little different than what you're talking about. But um, I, I can kind of so long for so long in my life, I blamed God for what happened to me and I blamed him for not protecting me. And now I'm able to look back and be like, oh no, I can see where man did evil and awful things to me. And but God was actually preventing, protecting me, right? And God was actually there um, in a way for me that I just, uh, even today, I don't see right or understand, but even then, like I didn't see or understand. Um, one of the other things that is a little bit more fun to talk about is uh, I actually... So I lived in Texas for about most of my life. Um, and uh, it was about a year and a half ago. And during the middle of COVID, uh, I, I decided that I had always wanted to be a digital nomad. I'd always wanted to live abroad. Um, and I just could never seem to take that leap. There was always one thing or another that was preventing me from doing it. And so about a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, kind of when COVID was kind of first starting and happening, um, I decided that uh, it was time. So the biggest contract I had in business ended and my lease was about up and I was just like, I need to, I need to go. So I sold all my stuff, got rid of everything and I took off uh, and I live and I had very recently accepted Christ. So I had accepted Christ uh, in October of 2020, I think it was accepted Christ and, and wasn't, but a couple weeks later I took off, sold all my stuff and took off. And so when I look back at that moment, um, I realized that I, God needed me removed from that environment in Texas. Mm -hmm. He needed me away from, because the people who 
or in the cult that I was raised in, were all very near, right? And even though I tried to have big boundaries and didn't really interact, I knew that they could show up at my house anytime, but most of them are related to me, right? So there's all these weird interactions. There's a lot of pressure and I can see where God was like, hey, I got to pull you out of here, right? And so God created the circumstances that allowed me to be able to leave. Uh, and I lived in Aruba for several months. And then I lived in Costa Rica for several months. And in that process, I got to see things in this world. Like I had traveled before, but I had not lived that way um, mm-hmm. as a traveler. And man, I had to see beauty, like swimming with the turtles uh, in the oceans in Aruba and having local people invite me over for backyard barbecue and having, you know, their barbecue is way different than U.S. barbecue, right? Yeah. But like having those. And then even in Costa Rica, um, seeing people who were just like, I mean, poor, poor, like living in cement, large cement building blocks that weren't even buildings, right? Just poor. And they were so happy. They were jumping and the kids were jumping in the puddles and playing in the mud and just, just smiling and laughing and happy. And, uh, and then to see, you know, things like sloths and like all these other animals that you don't see in a typical zoo, right? It allowed me to just see that there's so much more being able to eat mangoes that fell from the tree on my way to the beach, right? To go swim, like things like that, that it opened my eyes to a lot more of God's beauty and a lot more of God's, I guess, the wonder in the world. Um, and so I actually was going to continue to live that lifestyle. Uh, but I um, had met a woman in a Facebook group. It sounds so weird. I met a woman in a Facebook group who we were doing business. We just did business together. It was a marketing group and we connected. Um, and uh, I post a lot on Facebook about, just my personal journey, what I'm learning about overcoming trauma, what I'm learning about those types of things. And she and I did business together and we became Facebook friends. And uh, one day I posted on Facebook uh, that I didn't know that healthy love between adults wasn't transactional. So I always thought like, if I'm dating someone uh, and I don't take the trash out that day, I think maybe they don't love me as much. Uh, mm. And I literally really truly thought that. And that's um, the, and so, some of the cult upbringing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And I yeah. thought, God, so, so yes, exactly. And so some, one of the things I would often ask my friends, uh, do you still love me today? And my friends, like for years, would be like, yes, Sarah. But sometimes they would be like, why do you keep asking us that? I'm like, I don't know. I just need to make sure. But in my subconscious, my mind, like I wanted to make sure my meter hadn't gotten too low. I didn't need to do something to make you keep loving me, right? Yeah. So I made a post when I finally realized and recognized that about, a year and a half ago, I made that post on Facebook about it as I was in Costa Rica, living in Costa Rica, made that post on Facebook about it and about how I, how I figured out how it was a transactional and what a surprise that was to me. Um, and this particular woman, she reached out to me privately and she said, hey, Sarah, I know I'm not trying to be weird. I know we just do business together, but I just thought maybe I'd mentioned that God's love isn't transactional either. Like he just, he just loves you for you. Unconditional. Um, yeah. Yeah. And something about the way she reached out to me made me really curious because I was like, you know something I don't know. And she wasn't trying to shove religion down my throat. She wasn't trying to be forceful about it. She wasn't saying it was just like a simple like, hey, I just thought you'd like to know this. And I was like, that's so weird. Um, (laughs) So uh, like I said, I was still in Costa Rica at the time. Well, I needed supplies. I needed to get uh, like some batteries I needed to get my computer fixed and I wanted to see a, an aunt of mine. And so um, I ended up, uh, my in, my time with immigration was up in Costa Rica and I was like, well, I'll come back to the U.S. and I'll get the supplies I need and see my, my aunt I want to see. And then um, I was going to take off and go to Granada next. So that was my whole plan. So I came back to the U.S., and I bounced around and ended up a couple of people here in the U.S. that I do business with. We're like, hey, like, since you're in the U.S., let's make let's meet up. So I ended up um, I went to Arizona and then I went to see somebody in Utah. And then uh, I ended up coming down to Florida to do business, which is where my, my business friend also happens to be. And so she, we'd never met in person. We'd only been business and friends online. And so she said, well, Sarah, let's uh, if, we, if you're in town, like, you know, I said, can we meet up? And she said, yeah, we can meet up. So she met me. and. Um, we had started doing Bible study together. Um, and so when we met in person, it was really cool to meet somebody who, um, I don't know, knew so much about God and had been kind of talking to me and working with me and was so loving and so kind, but I was still determined to uh, leave. So I was still determined to leave back out of the country and, and go to Granada. 
Um, but immigration became hard because of uh, COVID and restrictions mm -hmm. and other things. And so actually leaving back out of the U.S. became hard. So I got mad about that. So what ended up happening was I got mad again at God. So I get, I was a Christian. I had accepted Christ, but I was just mad at God all the time still. Um, and so it had pointed out to me um, that it was okay to be mad at God. And I said, what do you mean it's okay to be mad at God? No, it's not okay to be mad at God. And uh, so to she and this other friend of mine, they said, Sarah, they said, you, you, uh, you know, God knows your thoughts, right? <laughs> like, yeah. He knows what you're thinking. Like you might as well just tell it. Uh, so I ended up writing, uh, and I was in North Carolina now. So now I'm at another friend's house in North Carolina, uh, still trying to get back out of the country. I ended up writing God, a, I don't know, five to six page rage letter. I mean, I, I was like, I hate you. I was so mad. I was like, I want to leave this country. I want out of here. And then why didn't you protect me as a kid? Like all oh, just, it was ugly, all this ugly stuff. Uh, and it was funny because I wrote that and kind of got out of my system. And then I, I, I love to write. And so then I felt, started to fall asleep. And all of a sudden I woke up and I was like, oh, I need to say I'm sorry. It wasn't him that did this. It was totally man. So I got back up and I wrote God an apology letter. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I keep misunderstanding who you are. Like, I'm trying really hard. <laughs> like, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then when I finished that, I started to fall asleep again. And all of a sudden I woke up and I was like, I have to be baptized. I had, I want to be baptized and I had been trying as I traveled uh, to be baptized, but most of the, well, all the churches I went to and asked wouldn't baptize me because um, they said they needed me to be a member of the community and the congregation. They needed other people in the community to know me before they would baptize me and community scared me, scared me, still does scare me. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm one, I don't know how long I'm going to be here because of immigration and two, no. Um, so I had never been baptized. And so even though I had accepted Christ, and so I was in North Carolina and I messaged my, my Bible study friend, this friend of mine uh, who I did business with, who's now doing Bible studies with me. And I told her, I said, I have to, I, I want to be baptized. I don't care if I walk to a church on the street, somebody's got to baptize me, I want to be baptized. Uh, and she said, well, funny enough, she said, our church is actually having baptisms uh, this weekend. And uh, she said, I can ask the pastor if he'd be willing to baptize you. And I said, Okay, ask you. So uh, the pastor and I got up on the phone together the next day, and uh, the pastor actually thought uh, that I was in Florida. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm in North Carolina. And so he asked me typical questions, which was strange because his questions, um, they were like friendly, easy to answer questions. Uh, when I was baptized as a, so I had been baptized into the cult as a child. Uh, but I had to go through a whole list of very legalistic questions and you had to answer them right. If you didn't get them right, you couldn't be baptized. I mean, it was like a whole thing. It would took yeah. an hour and a half, two hours, right? It was a thing. And the pastor here, he was just so, oh, he just she was accepted Christ and what's your relationship with Jesus like, right? Those kind of, and I was like, this is different. So um, all that to say, he, he said, he was like, yeah, I'd be happy to baptize you. Uh, and so that was the Wednesday and the baptisms were Saturday. So I bought a place how are you getting here? I said, I might have played ticket. <laughs> so I bought a plane ticket from North Carolina to Florida. And I came down here and was baptized um, by, by him and, and here in the ocean at sunrise. And I love the ocean. I love there. I, I feel like that's where I could actually connect really, truly hear God. And so it was amazing to be baptized here in the ocean. Um, and uh, when I came the second time, I met my friends, family, and I met other people at the church. And then uh, a whole bunch of other stuff happened. Uh, and I ended up deciding that uh, this is where God wanted me to be. This is where I needed to be. Um, and so uh, I have been here in Florida for the last, almost the last year. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how God just pushes you in these little <clears throat> areas <laughs> and just gives you these little I, nudges. <laughs> I often say, it's funny, uh, I often say I feel like God's nagging me. I, I feel like I get a nag, but I need to do something, right? Even if I don't want to do it. Uh, it's funny because people are like, they're nudging is a much nicer way to put that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It feels like a nag because yeah. it's just like, you got to do this, you got to do this. Yeah, he uses so. the Holy Spirit in, in so many ways yeah. to just speak to you and, and guide you. And and even when, when you're not a Christian, you know, he, he chases people. People are like, well, God already knows. He chooses who's going to be an, a Christian. It's like, he doesn't choose who's going to be a Christian. He knows who's yeah. going to make that choice. 
Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, he pursues people because he wants them to have that choice and he loves them. He wants everybody to, to, to worship him because he loves all of us. We're his children. And I see that so much in your story there. Um, how did you finally come to the decision that, you know, I need Christ. Like I need to, I need to follow him. How did you come to that decision? So I had had over the, over the, after leaving the cult I was raised in, I had had a wide variety of friends and a wide variety of different religions. Um, and I had kind of put my toe in the water and some different things, kind of trying to figure it out. Um, but honestly, the trauma was so extensive, especially with the use of the Bible that um, anytime I went more than to a couple uh, church talks or sermons or any of that kind of stuff, I, I couldn't, I just, I couldn't, it was, it was awful. Um, and so what ended up happening, I had done tons of therapy and tons of personal development. Um, but what ended up happening is I met someone who is really a specialist with trauma and uh, she worked with me uh, quite a bit on overcoming a lot of the trauma I had been through. And at one point, um, it just finally clicked. Like, this is what I say. I tell, I tell people, I mean, it takes a village. It, it takes, for me, it took, for me, it took a village. And uh, we had been working together for about a year on some of the trauma stuff. And then one day I was driving in the car and I started thinking about um, a lot of my Christian friends, even back to college and the things that they had said to me about Jesus and about God. And some of the sermons that they had recommended that I listened to and some of the things that some of the quite like some of my friends let me ask them, you know, questions and stuff. And some of the questions, the way they had answered questions for me uh, throughout the years. And then I thought about um, just the way God I kind of like I felt like kind of shown up, even though I was still mad. I was still like, oh, they're like. And it got to this point where I got home and it was late at night. And I got to this point where I was like, I need someone else to lead my life. I can't, I cannot do this anymore. Um, and so that's what I did. I prayed and I asked Jesus if he would come into my heart and lead my life. And uh, it was the weirdest thing because people tell me sometimes they'll say, they'll tell me their stories of kind of accepting Jesus or asking for right, something Christ. And they're like super emotional. And, and that's kind of, mine wasn't, I was just like almost a place of desperation like I am not doing something right like please help me um and uh so I went to bed and the next day I woke up and I mentioned it to a couple of my Christian friends and uh so funny one of them she said to me oh good she said so I'll see you in heaven and it struck me as so odd I was like why would I do that for heaven it doesn't make sense. I didn't even because heaven as I had been one as I'd been being raised heaven wasn't really a thing right yeah and then two I was like that's not why I did it. I did it because I need help and I need Jesus to help me. <laughs> I need him in my life. I need him in my life right now. Right. Like I'm not, I'm not thinking that's so sad. I literally need help today. Uh, and so um, over the years, a lot of people had told me, uh, Sarah, we're praying for you. We're praying for you to heal. We're praying for you. Right. And I was raised to be polite. So I would always say thank you, but it would kind of grit it and like, gr like grind my gears a little bit, like irritate me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but I think about that now. I mean, one of the women I know, she's been praying for six or seven years now <laughs> for me. Uh, and it prior to me accepting Christ, right? And I think about that and I'm so grateful because I, I truly believe that their prayers uh, did help. But it was really healing with the, that uh, parts of the trauma. Um, and so uh, that's the other thing, if I can kind of lead into. So, so that yeah. piece, right, of me accepting Christ and then me taking off. I mean, you know, traveling the world <laughs> for, you know, almost a year. Um, but when I got here to Florida, uh, so when I was traveling, you know, I was doing my Bible study online with my, my friend here and a couple other things, but I wasn't attending church. I wasn't going anywhere, obviously, right on, on, a, on a weekly basis. I wasn't, um, you know, I don't, I, you guys call it communion. I was in communion. Sorry, sometimes the old language kicks into my head. So as a kid, we called it breaking bread. So I'm, I went to say, like, we were breaking, we were, I wasn't breaking bread. I was, that's not what they say, they say communion. So anyway, so I wasn't taking communion. I wasn't doing those types of things. Um, and so uh, when I got here to Florida, and it was like, hey, like, there's a church to attend weekly. There's church, right, all this stuff. It, 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 was, it was hard, and I'm not going to lie. Like, it was terrifying. 
because I constantly am like on the lookout. Like, am I being manipulated? Are they lying to me? Is what they're saying true? Are they going to hurt me? Like, is something going to happen? And so, um, and then, you know, you walk into a Sunday sermon and the pastor's talking about a verse in the Bible. (laughs) And inevitably, it was tied to something I had been abused learning about or that had been used to manipulate me to keep me quiet. And so this is where um, I try and tell Christians today, like, you don't ever know what someone is walking into the church with. You don't know. And so people would see me and I would seem calm and cool and collected. But thankfully, my my friend here who disciples me uh, or mentors me, whatever you guys call it, um, she um, I, she has the help of the Holy Spirit because she would, I would sit next to her, I guess I sit with her family at church. And she would sit next to me and inevitably we would be halfway through a a talk or sermon or whatever. And I would feel like this, like touch on my shoulder where I would hear like a, Hey, are you okay? I had no earthly Mm -hmm. clue how she knew, but I was totally gone. Trauma triggered thinking about something else that happened, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago in my life. And it would click me back into reality. And I'd be like, Oh, right. Right. Okay. (laughs) And then I was like doing this grounding text. You are right. So I would ground myself back into reality and be able to sit through the rest of the sermon and hear what the pastor was saying. And um, then my friend would let me talk later if I need to invent about like, well, this happened. And why is he saying it means this? Because actually it means this. And they said it right. And she would just let me kind of get it all out. Um, And our pastor here, uh, he actually met with me several times too, to kind of talk with me and help me feel safe and help work with that kind of stuff. And then, um, but without that, I don't think I'd have been able to stay. I really don't because it, even with accepting Christ and even if wanting to be able to figure out that community and love piece, I don't think I'd have been able to. Um, but now like, I'm so thankful for the church. Uh, I mean, there's people who are wiser in years than me that like have me over for dinner and uh, tr- you know, they almost treat me like I'm a, I don't know, like another kid of theirs. Right. And totally dote on me and uh, people hug me and tell me, you know, how much they enjoy seeing me. And uh, for the Bible studies, like we're studying Luke, uh, one of the Bible studies which is really cool. Um, and God is giving me the gift of helping me um, have some memories of what I was taught as a kid that maybe is more factual based. Um, like we were t- talking about revelations the other day and it tied into King Uzziah. And so the pastor was talking about it. And I remembered, I mean, I haven't read about that King and I don't know how long. Right. But I remember, oh so, yeah, that was the King that became the King when he was young. So he needed the help of advisors, right. Because he was so young and all that kind of clicked into my head. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'm remembering that from my childhood, but not in a bad way. It's just like, oh yeah, right. This is the knowledge I need to have right to be able to move on. And so things like that now are starting to happen where I'm like, okay, I can remember things and it's not all trauma related and it's not all awful, but like some of it is actually helpful to me um, and being able to straighten that out. And then um, thankfully here, it's a Bible, you know, Bible-based teaching church. Um, so there's a lot of people from a lot of different denominations who come and some of that has been helpful too. Um, and people will sometimes, um, I try and explain to people the difference, the main big difference for me now in the community, the church I'm in now versus the cult I was raised in is that I'm allowed to have independent thought. And our pastor says from when I first got to this church, our pastor said from the stage, he said that you're allowed to disagree with me. If you disagree with me, it's okay. You come on in, bring your Bible and let's have a conversation about it. And I about fell out of the chair. I thought you have to be insane. Yeah. Like you're, you're the pastor saying we could disagree with you. Like what world are you coming from? Uh, <laughs> It's so, but I so value that, that I can disagree or have another opinion or right, seek to figure something out to seek if we can get on the same page or not, or how I was raised, like you were not allowed to have independent thought. I was often told, you know, to quit asking questions or to not ask questions that way or to, to not write. And it's so different, um, which is really cool because it allows you to see God from so many different angles and perspectives. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and God wants you to question so that you can, you can go to research and find those answers and, and go to people who, like you say, are wiser in years, who yeah. you can talk to. Like that's why churches have deacons and elders is so that you can go and you can talk to these people and they can help you walk through these questions. And, and God wants us to, to do that because we grow that way. So I think that's yeah. very important. And your friend um, just being able to see, when you're, when you're maybe having issues or struggling, that sounds exactly like my wife, because 
Um, okay. I come from a trauma background myself. And okay. so it, it just, she, she can tell usually when things trigger and, okay. and she'll just, I can tell she's looking at me and looking at me <laughs> and it's just like, and it's just like, yep. Yeah. Okay. Like, let's just deal with this. Like, or when we're watching something, something comes up, she'll be like, should we be watching this now? Like, cause, cause awesome. she knows yeah. it might be a trigger. Like, yeah. like, yeah, there's shows we've just stopped watching because they're yeah. a trigger. They'll bring back yeah. flashbacks and memories. And, yep. and so it's just even music. Sometimes I hear a song and I'll just break down into tears and I'll be just like, I, I can't listen to that song. Like I just, I can't do it. Yep. And uh, good on her for, for seeing that and you and be willing to, you know, talk to you about that. Like that's, that is a great friend. And yeah. that's uh-huh. why one of the reasons I married my wife is she's <laughs> Aww, <laughs> she is that sweet. way. I mean, she's just, yeah. she's amazing that way. So, and she's been there through a lot. Like even when I hide my pain, a lot of people can't tell that I'm in pain, but my wife can usually tell. And she'll be like, do yeah. we need to go home? Like, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm that's glad you have a friend like that life. too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I feel really blessed. I mean, the, the people here, my friend, her family, they've kind of adopted me. The church is really kind of greeting me with open and loving arms. And so, yeah. So how has your life improved since you've, since you've come to Christ? Okay. So <laughs> one of the things I do like to say is that uh, my life is a bazillion times better walking with Christ or trying to anyway, walking with God, walking with Christ, having accepted him. Um, But it's not always easy because sometimes he asks me to do things that are very hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, The the difference between that uh, and my life before is that I have assurance. I'm I'm a best base, right? I'm a good base. I have the assurance and the faith and the knowledge, right, that he's got my back and that he loves me unconditionally. And um, knowing that changes how you approach life. Um, And also being able to read the scripture and see kind of like the ideal way of, right, of how we should be living, how we should be loving people, loving God and loving others, right? It, It enhances everything. It makes life so much better. And then also being able to see everyone's to everyone so many people's mistakes in the bible helps too because yeah. it helps me remember like it's okay that i'm human i'm not going to be perfect like in this right like i think about paul you know he's he says uh by the grace of god that i am what i am and his grace to me is not without effect right i think about that all the time because i'm yeah. like oh, okay, paul was a hothead it's... too like <laughs> yeah he was yeah, and, and yeah. peter right peter like chopping yeah. his ears off and get yeah. right and all these things and it's like okay um but all that to say uh my life is, is better simply because I know that I have God's love in my life. And that has created some security and some, I don't know, it's like relief. Um, and so I'm so thankful for that. But then in that process too, right, is being able to develop healthier relationships with people. Um, which is hard when you come from which is trauma background. Right? Super hard, right? Fun. Yep. Yeah. But being able to develop some of those healthier relationships, um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur business goes up and down, but before I think business would go down and uh, it's almost like the end of the world is coming or like there's some kind of existential void coming. Right. Yeah. And now like I get down when business goes down, but I also know God's in control. And so that if I just take like James, if I just take some steps I need to take, right. Then or I think God wants me to take, right. If I'm acting in the way I think I need to be acting that, you know, business will pick back up and it'll be okay. Um, and there's just like a, a security there, right. There's, there's a security there that I didn't, I didn't have before. And also the other thing I should mention is I, I, man, I was so, I, I was so angry and there were people who I truly hated in my heart. Um, and I have, prayed and prayed and prayed and asked God to help me with forgiveness uh, because I was not, even through all the people tell you, you know, Oh, you should forgive. Oh, you should forgive. Even therapy and personal development, all that. They tell you, Oh, you should forgive. It's like, okay, well tell me how to do that. Right. Yeah. Or like, why? I don't want to forgive for them. Right. But it came to this point about seven or eight months ago where I thought I can't live with this anger and this hate in my heart so much anymore. 
Um, and even if I didn't express it, like I felt it, right. Even if I wasn't outwardly expressed, I could feel it. And so seven or eight months ago, I started praying. I was like, God, please help me. Please help me with this. Um, and, uh, God has, I am so thankful to say he has, and I am able to, uh, sit at a dinner table with people who I really hated and despised before. And now, you know, I have really healthy boundaries. I keep really close, you know, tabs on my boundaries, on my trauma reactions and my self-care. Right. But I pray for the men who abuse me. I pray for my family. I ask God to please open their eyes to him so that they can see him and see Christ and have a relationship with Jesus. Right. And I mean, a year ago, I told you I wanted to kill him, right? And so now I find myself praying, like, oh, please help open their eyes. Please help them to see you for who you actually are. Um, and that piece of forgiveness um, has kind of like melted my heart, right? Yeah. God allowing me to forgive. Yeah, uh, holding on to grudges and, and what happened even though hurts it's you more than like, hurts others. <laughs> yeah, but it's one of those things where I didn't understand. People would say that before and I wouldn't understand. Um, and you know, quote unquote, I feel like I have a quote unquote right, right. <laughs> to be, to be yeah. angry, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be mad. And so, um, that has just also kind of revolutionized my life. Um, being able to give that kind of grace and love to people that I didn't think uh, was ever going to be possible for me to do. So, yeah. And that it's like a huge b- boulder off your shoulders, right? <laughs> I like, yeah. that weight is gone. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah. Like it's yeah. not. But uh, that's that's exactly why we're, we're called to forgive is because, well, look what Jesus did for us. I mean, he had every reason to hate every single one of us for the but, sins we've committed. And yet he reaches out and he tells us he loves us and he's forgiven us and he died on the cross for us. And I mean, that's, can you get any more love and, and passion than that, than sacrificing your own life for, for, for everybody? else's i mean that's it's just amazing and so that yeah. is something i've had to remind myself in, in my own forgiveness journey is just yeah is just yeah I, jesus loved me he forgave me i should be able to move on and forgive the same and well the thing is though the thing i had to come to realize is i i couldn't on my own yeah. so I, that's the thing i was like i should be able to well i can't it is and that's the thing that, that changed everything for me it was when i realized that's like oh god is giving me this gift of being able to forgive because yeah. I couldn't on my own as a human. And there's people who've known me for, you know, 20 years. We've been friends for 20 years who are like, Sarah, how are you able to go to dinner with these people? Or how are you able to even communicate with these people? How are you doing this? And I'm like, I can't. It's not me, right? <laughs> God, God yeah. gave me, I, it is truly God. And, and God's using you to reach out to them is what he's doing. And so that has been really, uh, and that's been a nice part of my testimony too, I think. I like to say God, God's journey, God working in my life, right? I think that's been a nice part of like God working in my life that people have been able to tangibly see that have known me a long time because they're like, oh, yeah. wow, okay. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like, it is different with, with Jesus. It is different with God. Yeah, well, and that will encourage them in their own walk, like that they can see that in you. And I think that it's amazing. And it is hard to forgive people who've, who've done those kinds of things. But once you do, like you say, it's a weight off your shoulders. It's just, you just feel a lot more at peace and uh, it helps you, helps you move on. Struggling with yep. relationships is still, is still a thing. Like it's just, yep. you know, I still tr- struggle to let people in and, and uh, okay. keep in contact with people. Like it's just, it's an everyday battle to just be like, okay, I really, really need to work on this. My, my relationship with these, with these friends, because, you know, they are trying, nothing is their fault. Like it's, it's those barriers I've put up because of what's happened and, yeah. and Jesus tries to knock down those barriers. That's, that's what he does. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I told a friend of mine today, I said, I feel like I'm doing the push pull thing with you. Cause I'll do like a little bit of a push pull. And I said, I don't want to do this with you. I feel like I'm doing a push pull. I'm feeling really insecure. Right. But being able to, to name that and own that and say like, this is how I am feeling. I am feeling insecure in our friendship. Right. Can we, you know, can, can we just, can you, right. Can you just work with me on this? <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, ha- being, but being able to name that and own that and have that kind of conversation uh, is so different. And I think about that, you know, I talk to God too sometimes and I'm like, I feel like I'm kind of doing the push pull with you. Like I'm feeling irritated today. Or I feel right. And I tell God those things. Right. And I'm like, can you, can you help me? Can you, can you use this for me? And oftentimes I'll think of a Bible verse 
or a friend will text me something random or a song, right? And like, oh, thanks God, cool. Like, okay, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, but that's a p- definitely the piece of, of healing the trauma. And uh, I'm certainly not in the perfect place with it, but I, it, but it's a, it's a journey. And I think of that Romans verse that, you know, God will use everything for good for those that love him. It's different than that. But, you know, I, I think about that a lot, right? And I think about what I've been through and I think, well, it certainly was evil, but you know, if, if God can use it for his good, then, okay, let's go forward together, God. And like, let's use it for your good. Well, and praying for God's guidance in, in every turn of your life is, is very important. Like it's, I I was praying about this thing because there's, there's somebody, I won't mention her name, um, but she was pursuing me, wanting me to be an ambassador for her and, and wanting me to have her on my show and wanted me to come on her show. When I went to go on her show, uh, her TV program, uh, they were really, really late and no one messaged me to say that they were really, really late. So I oh. waited like half an hour and oh. in the waiting room. And I'm just like, I'm like, you know, God, I've been praying for answers as to whether or not this is what you want me to do. I take this as, as you telling me exactly what you wanted me to do. Yep. So I, I left the waiting room and I sent them an email um, saying, you know, I've been praying and I, uh, I, whether this is where I'm to go and God I feel has just told me this is not where I should go I'm sorry but I'm not going to be able to have you on my show I'm not going to appear on your show I'm not going to be a part of your ambassador program or, or I'm uh, being an ambassador for yeah. you I'm, it's just yeah it was a great opportunity but it wasn't where God wanted me and while the message I got back was awful it oh, was no. absolutely awful. I couldn't believe it. Um, just, it was uh, something, it was like, um, I think you should forget my email because um, you are, I think you are a fraud because there's no way you are as old as you say you are. Um, oh, you, wow. Because you look like, you look too young to be as old as you say you are. Um, so have, have fun. God would have wanted this. Um, blessings, little man. And I was just like, I was going to respond like, cause I'd already deleted her email. So I was going to respond like, I already deleted your emails. So I'd already moved on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Then, and then I, my second reaction was, well, thanks for the compliment. Like, obviously I age yeah. well. If you don't think I look like yeah. I'm 34, then, then, well, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the compliment. And I kind of posted yeah. on Facebook um, when when uh, you're praying to God for an answer and then God right, right up, so, or stops you right upside the head and, and, and gives you that answer. And it's like, thank you, God. There's your answer. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, obviously that wasn't the person I wanted to be working with. And um, that wasn't a very Christian response. So obviously you aren't the Christian you say you are. So, so I was just like, yep. well, thanks for the answer, God. Like you, he really does. He like, he does give you answers when you pray. And they may yeah. not always come in the form that you expect them. Like I, I laugh about it because I actually think it was kind of funny that like you got so upset about this. Like yeah. you're, you're supposed to be this big TV producer and, and all this, but you're little old me and you're upset that I don't want to work with you. Like well, you obviously have it's some, some kind of emotional, like tied to it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those great reminders of like our humanness, right? Of like yeah. how human we can all be, and like the importance too. Like you said, of like God, God hears, God hears our prayers, and and He will answer. It may not be in the way we expect or in the way we want, but like you know, He does hear our prayers. And and, come in humorous, in humorous yep. things. Like yep. I mean, a lot of people are like, oh man, you you must be so. Upset. I'm like, I wasn't upset. I actually laughed. And, uh, I thought it was kind yeah. of funny. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because I and like I must have triggered some narcissist bone in their body or something. <laughs> yeah, triggered something. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just like, well, you know, I I prayed to God, and yeah, that was an answer He gave me, and uh, yeah. I don't always get answers right away. And there's other um, radio programs that I've been talking to about possibly getting on with, and it's just like, well. I pray about those too. And well, God, you'll lead me where you want me. You'll take me where you want me to go. Definitely. And everything with my channel is God. He That's leads awesome. everything. And yeah. I, I, I'm in 35 countries and I don't take any credit for that. 
God has brought it to where he wants it to go. And that's always my prayer. And same with your testimony. Like before I always pray, you speak your words, not ours. Like let it reach at least one yep. person. That That's all that's I awesome. hope is that it reaches one person. So yep. thank you for coming on and, and for sharing this. I've really, really appreciated it. And it's, it's been a real yep. blessing speaking to you and uh, I all enjoy speaking to you a little bit more in the after show here. Uh, so uh, thank you again for coming on. Uh, thank you, you for having final- me. Do you want to have any final thoughts you want to leave us before we uh, head to the after show? Uh, I don't think so. I just, I like to remind people that it says to love the Lord thy God, right? Love him first and love others second and to do what we can to show the love of Jesus as we can in the world. Even remember that we're all human, but that's, that's the goal. And uh, again, thanks for having me on. That was great to chat with you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Well, I have just been uh, blessed with so many people who are requesting to be on the show, and I'm impressed with how many people want to share their testimonies or what they're doing uh, for the Lord right now. Uh, If I haven't got back to you, I promise I will get back to you. Uh, I look forward to to speaking with each of you and interviewing you. And uh, keep tuning into the show. There's lots of, of new people that are coming on here, and if you're considering wanting to to come on the show uh just shoot me an email at tpeters745 at gmail.com and uh, i will get back to you 